All right, guys, we're back with Todd Driscoll, Park and Wildlife Fisheries Biologist. This is our fifth video in the series, and from their observations on the Toledo Bend tracking study, Todd's going to talk to us a little bit about the movement of those fish. Yeah, we've talked some about, you know, the, the lack of movement. It's what's, what's been, been interesting, you just the overall lack of movement, and, and we've been measuring it in, in feet per day. Now, keep in mind, we're only tracking these fish every two weeks, right? So when we mark a fish on, on, on one day and then two weeks later mark it somewhere else, we just measure that as the crow flies over that 14 days. And we divide the numbers out so it's reflective of, of feet moved per day. Okay. Now, that fish might be moving four times that amount in a 24-hour cycle every day. But, you know, there's been studies that have looked at some of that daily movement. We just never had a, an objective or an interest to do that. So just keep that in mind, though, as I talk about these numbers. I mean, it, th these numbers are just looking at overall bi-weekly or, or monthly seasonal type movement patterns, okay? When we pull all of our observations together, on average, our bass moved 150 feet per day, period. Okay. Not much. That's pretty low. You know, if you come, you know, Right off the top, I think in the first video, I talked about a couple other studies on large reservoirs, right? If you, if you look at the results from those studies, it is relatively similar, but Toledo Bend fish moved even less than they did on uh, Lake Seminole in Georgia. That's a 34,000 acre lake in Lake Martin, Alabama. That's about 40,000 acres. Those two studies were very similar. Those fish moved like 260 feet or so a day. Our fish only moved 150 feet per day. So we're still, talking, these fish moved less than eight boat lengths a day. Yes. That's not much. Not much at all. Not now, much at that's, all. That's horizontal, not vertical. But I, I think you've talked before about fish really can't make huge movements in the water column for extended periods of time in a given day because of their swim bladder, right? Yeah, and you know, again, it's, it's what I said just a few minutes ago. Uh, keep in mind what these measurements are. You know, we're not we're not measuring the movement every two or three hours. I mean, the fish right. could be moving a quarter mile every 24 hour cycle, but yet its overall pattern of movement on every two weeks or a month scale, you know, isn't much. Well, and and I mean, you've got a couple of fish that skew the crap out of this data, right? I mean, you yeah, take, I mean, what you yeah, take you the three or four down, fish. And, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, you boil all this down, again, even on large reservoirs like Toledo Bend, where a fish can swim pretty much as far as it dang well wants to, right? Most simply don't. Only a small percent, only a few do. Why those few do that? Only the bass knows. And again, I think it just it's just common sense, right? You know, on, on productive lakes with lots of cover, you know, just natural biological processes are just going to dictate that, that a fish is, is only going to move as little as it has to. Well, and you and I talked about this in one of the earlier videos. I'll put a link above, guys, if you haven't seen that. This is a Toledo bin with no grass habitat right now. Yes. So if you threw, if you, threw you know, eight, eight to 17 foot hydrilla back in this mix, I get a feeling that compresses that travel even more. You know, on the outset, I, I would have agreed with you, but our movement is so little anyway. I'm not really sure how much lower it can get, to be honest yeah, with you. Good point. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, 150 feet per day, that's, that, that's, that, that's almost no movement. That's really. like you walking back and forth across your house two or three times. Yeah. And if you look at the individual averages for each individual bass, you know, we summed up all observations, look at on average. I mean, even though the overall range was only 25 to 450 feet per day. Even those fish that were trying to skew the data, I mean, they, they, they would hold up for periods of time and not move at all. And then every once in a while make a big movement. But, but even then, the, the fact that they hunkered down for a while even, even lowered that average. That still just screws with my head that there's fish that, you know, the fish that went from basically the Indian mound to the back of housing to the Indian mounds to the back of housing uh, multiple times. That just, I, I never, ever would have anticipated that happening. Yeah, and during that same period, you know, we had three additional fish in the back of house in there that just stayed on the main creek. Over so there was plenty of back there. Over there was a 400 yard area. They never left over the whole study period. 
except to maybe move closer to the bank to spawn, but they never left while that one six pounder was doing that behavior. Yeah, it just it just doesn't really add up, you know. And if you look at it seasonally, you know, I think this this makes would make sense to most, you know, during the springtime, you know, we had some of those huge movements of main lake fish back into housing the spawn that, that skewed the average during the spring, they moved the most at 315 feet a day. And it was the least during the fall at 85 feet per day. That would be again, kind of counter. I would have thought there was more forage chasing in the fall feeding up for the winter, but not the case. I guess the forage comes to them. It does. And you know that the, the, the old adage that a lot of us are familiar with about some speculation about a fall migration of bass to the backs of creeks and whatnot. I mean, there hasn't been one single iota of evidence in our study that that happens at all. I mean, fish just stay put. They do. I mean, I won't deny that the fishing's better in the backs of the pockets in the creeks in the fall to some degree, but just the cooler water makes them more active over larger periods of the day, I would suspect, right? Mm -hmm. It's not like fish are moving three miles in the fall to the backs of the pockets. You know, there's been z absolutely none of our fish have done that. Yeah. Wow. We can move on to, to depth, depth of water. Average depth of these fish was 11 feet. Uh, the overall average range was four to 26. You know, we talked a little bit about the, the, the absolute extreme measurements. You know, we had a, just three fish, what, over 45 feet of water was on. And those fish were suspended. They weren't in the bottom in those depths, best we could tell. And, and again, seasonally, this makes perfect sense. You know, during the spawn, the average depth was, was the least. On average, they were in eight feet of water. And the deepest was during the wintertime when they averaged uh, 17 feet in depth. So the... One of the main, one of the main things you wanted to investigate was fish's reaction to boats. Right, and we're, we're going to get to that here in just just a few minutes. You got something else before we go there? We have. We can hop right to that if you want. No, if you got something else, I don't want to. I don't want to stop you talking about this stuff because it's all fascinating to me. Okay, and I mean, I just had this stuff, some notes here, no particular order, but. Uh, Suspended or bottom oriented. I think that's very informational. It's very good. You know, from an angling perspective, I know it is always to me. Uh, of course, we determined this with live scope as we approached the fish. We just had to make some assumptions. You know, obviously, as we're approaching this fish, if I don't ever see it, any fish at all, I just have to assume that our fish is by itself and it's on the bottom. I can't see anything. Whereas in contrast, if when we approach the location of this bass, if there's 5, 10, 15, 20 fish in a school suspended, and I don't see anything below, then I just have to assume that bass is part of that suspended. Scope. I think that's a good assumption. Yeah, you just that's what you have to do if you're going to do something like we're, like we're, like we did here. So when you pull all the all the uh, data together, fish were on the bottom 77 percent of the time, and I defined being on the bottom if they were within five feet of the bottom. Within five feet of the bottom, 77 percent of the time, that's where those fish were. Now th they were suspended most during the summertime, but it was still a relatively low percentage. Only 34% of the time were they suspended. That was in the summer, the highest season. Now, it changes a little bit if you only look at fish deeper than 10 feet, because obviously fish is in less than 10 feet. I mean, suspended on the bottom doesn't necessarily mean a whole lot at that point. Right. To me, it doesn't. So if you look at fish only deeper than 10 feet, they were on the bottom 67% of the time. And then if you look at fish only deeper than 20 feet, they were on the bottom 61% of the time. So still a, a majority of the time they were on the bottom, but the deeper the water you get, it's just the greater the chance they're going to be more than five feet off the bottom. But and even right. deeper than 20 feet, you know, only 39% of the time were they suspended in water deeper than 20 feet, 39%. So because of swim bladder, how much can a fish move up and down in the water column for any kind of extended period of time? Well, you know what? A fish can rapidly do that for, for you know, obviously as, as a fish is chasing shad, I mean, you got to believe at times it's, it's leaving 20 feet of water and to the surface and back down. You know, they have the ability to swim through all that. Their air bladder is not adjusting that quickly, but they, they have the ability to swim 
and get back where they want in very short intervals of time. It's just when us as anglers catch a fish out of 25 feet, hold it in the boat for five plus minutes of time and allows that air bladder to expand, then the fish can't get back down on its own. So that air bladder adjustment is very slow, but just naturally a fish can swim pretty rapidly, you know, through the depth, so to speak, from the surface to 25 feet and anywhere in between. It, it can. Let me rephrase my question. <clears throat> if a fish is set up in 20 feet of water today, it's not going to move to 10 feet of water or five feet of water and stay there today. Correct. It's got, or can, can they make that big of an adjustment? You know, you get down to details like that. It's, it's really hard to say. I don't know if there's ever been any studies at all to actually exactly measure the, the specific adjustment capabilities. I mean, just off the top of my head, I mean, from 20 to 10, it wouldn't surprise me if a fish could. It's just, you know, when you go from 18, 20, 25 feet to the surface when we're catching those fish, that's when we know that if we hold them up there for any length of time, that they're just not going to be able to adjust. Right. Yeah. Because yeah, we all know if we immediately release those fish, they can go right back there. Right. They do. Yeah. But it's about, you know, I don't think I'm off too far. It's around five minutes of time or so typically, you know, especially if you're, even if you're just taking pictures of a fish or something and, and, and going to release it immediately, you got about five minutes where you can. Anything beyond that, probably going to have to visit. So, and I'm going to just do a little Ken Smith uh, thing here. So for you guys who are catching fish and riding around all day to get a five, pitch, five fish pitcher, if you're catching those fish deep, you may be killing some of those fish. Get, get them, catch them, take your pitcher, send them back down deep. Or uh, know how to fizz fish. Know how to fizz. And to your point, not near enough anglers know how. I mean, so that, top, that what, so uh, somebody who properly knows how to fizz a fish, I know we're off topic, but what's the mortality rate if you really know how to fizz them? I mean, does, does that really hurt them at all? Well, uh, uh, a fellow biologist, uh, Randy Myers, he's a biologist in San Antonio. He yeah. oversees Lake Amistad. And again, it's just, you know, um, it's a condition with, with scientifically, it's called barotron. A bass that has an overinflated bladder and floats on the surface, that fish has barotron. On Lake Amistad, anybody familiar with Amistad, I mean, if there was a lake in Texas, that were a super high percent of fish caught are going to suffer barotrauma. If you don't know how to fish, that's like almost all just because of the clear water and the deep nature, so on and so forth. I mean, I, I don't recall what percent of fish he estimated caught in tournaments needed to be fizz, but I believe it was around 50% or so, you know, from firsthand observations. That's how critical knowing how to fizz is on a lake like Amistad. And because of that, that's why he did a, a study there. And his study showed that fizzing through the side, which is the preferred way, and this is based on his study findings, mortality rate, I think was, again, don't quote me on the exact numbers, maybe 10, around 10% or so, something like that. The mortality rate of, of going through the throat, like some people like to do, was, I think, 5 to 8% higher than going through the side. But some anglers might be aware that that's why we recommend side fishing is the preferred way to go. You know, you, you said some, you said something in one of our early videos and it's just really stuck in my head that, that of adult fish in our reservoirs, there's about a 20% natural, uh, a 20% natural uh, mortality rate. And so we don't want to add to that in any way possible. And the other thing that makes me think is, I don't know what the replacement, the natural replacement rate of fish is for themselves. Does that make sense? But right. yeah, we got to have stocking. We got to have Texas Park and Wildlife stocking to continue catching fish the way we catch fish. Yeah, the, the biological term for the replacement is what we call recruitment or, or year class strength, right? And that's why it's so critical to have good habitat. And that's why I lake like Sam Raber. You know, I always catch myself using the same term over and over. It's just an absolute fish factor. Why is it? is because, good grief, nine out of 10 years during the spring, we have tremendous habitat and it's typically flooded bushes. You know, so the more habitat you have, the more young fry survive to five, six, seven inches in length during that period of time, the higher the recruitment of those young bass are and the greater the year class strength is that yeah. all lead to 
greater adult bass abundance. So it's so critical on habitat and in lakes that have less habitat or poorer habitat, you know, stocking may have more impacts. So the high water has hurt our grass for the last year or two, but it has certainly, certainly helped our, our, our fish that get spawned, our new fish grow to maturity. Yeah, it's a very good way to put it. It's a double-edged sword at Sam Raver. And I love to fish high drill as much as anybody does. I mean, part of me, when the lake gets above 170, part of me takes a step back like, dang, why couldn't it just get up to like 168 or so, which is for those of the people that don't know it, that's four feet above pool for Sam Raver at 168. When it's at 168, you know, there's plenty of bushes, plenty of flooded cover, but at that level, it, it's going to kill a little bit of the hydrilla, but a lot of it's going to going to maintain itself over the winter. Well, and you and I talked, we're, we're to the end of this particular video, but you and I talked offline. I mean, what it boils down to is you put six plus feet of water on top of that hydrilla, it gets no grass, there's no, or it gets no sunshine, there's no photosynthesis, and that grass dies. Yeah, like right now, you know, you go really above, above beach, up towards 147 Bridge and North. I mean, and, and hey, I, Ken knows, I mean, I, I've been without an outboard engine for a couple of months, so I haven't been able to spend any time out there, okay? But from what I'm hearing, there's no grass. Well, further up late, you get just the more muddy the water is. So that yep. just makes pretty good sense. Now, way down south, you know, uh, Five Fingers, Coleman, Norris, Beach, but... Ken, correct Caney. me if I'm wrong, I think Caney has some grass. So, you know, some of the grass survived in the clear water areas, but, but yeah, I mean, common, that's just common sense. You know, when the lake gets 170 plus, uh, those of us that have lived here for years, I mean, it's just going to kill most of the grass. That's just yep. what it's going to do. Yep. All right. So, yeah, it's a double-edged sword. It gets super high. We still have great recruitment and survival of those little fish, but come June, July, August, September, October, or even like right now, when we don't get tons of rain during the spring, you know, it's it's there's just not a lot to, a lot of cover to fish out there. Yeah. So. All right. So that's uh, let's stop there. That'll be video five, guys, and we'll be back with what may be our concluding video. I don't know how much. I think, I think it will be. Yeah. All right. So we'll come back and let Todd give us uh, sort of our conclusions, what we've seen on the bass behavior, and uh, I'm also curious how it's changed his outlook on his tournament fishing as well. So. Thanks, Todd. We'll be back with uh, part six here in a sec.